What's going on, my beautiful listeners? This is The Last Coffee House. We are looking at the Sam Harris list. The kids are not all right. Something is going on with American youth, and the coddling of the American mind tries to explain it. Written by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. Published 2018, it is subtitled How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Lots and lots of failure. Epic failure, as the kids might say. Just kids still say epic? What are the contents of this thing, the search for wisdom? They begin with an oracle. An oracle that is espousing the three great untruths. Untruth number one, trust your feelings. Untruth number two, people are good or evil. And untruth number three, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. And these are some untruths that are gaining a lot of traction amongst our youth of today. Leads to poor psychological health. There's uniformity in universities, which is a problem, as we'll see. We have things like call-out culture. Historically, we would have protests on campuses, like there was a protest of E.L. Wilson, the biologist, for talking about evolution. But the framing of those protests was not to say that he was causing harm, just that his ideas were really bad. But that is dramatically changing. And we have this new development among students that students are fragile. And then we get this introduction into the biggest ideas out of here is the cognitive distortions that are being used by our children, young adults of today, and displayed all over the place. Things like catastrophizing or focusing on the negative. These are cognitive distortions, and we'll talk more about that. But one thing that the authors point out here is that we are teaching people to have anxiety and depression. This is something, this is a learned malady that our students are getting now because of the way that we're teaching them and bringing them up and a whole bunch of contextual issues. Even Obama, while president, referenced an article that was written by these two, I think it was a precursor to this book, where he talked about how he was worried about the coddling of American students nowadays. There's this kind of vindictive protectiveness. And like so many causes of horrible things in society, these may be based on good intentions, but they're bad ideas. Okay, into some substantive content here. The Untruth of Fragility is one of the chapters. And one thing that's brought up here is a really interesting way to frame this is peanut allergies. So peanut allergies, they had this dramatic increase at one point. And there was a discovery that allergies were actually surging because we were protecting students from allergies all throughout the 90s. So we were sequestering all of our kids, you know, as much as humanly possible from any contact with peanuts. And so that made them very weak to any kind of a, a stimulant like peanut. And that meant that a bunch of students who would have otherwise had regular contact with it and turned out fine, developed it, gotten over whatever allergy they might have had and gone into adulthood without an allergy. Now they didn't have any contact with it because of all the protectionism that's going on. And so if they do run into a peanut then it's more likely they're gonna have a severe allergy muscles need to be tested <laughs> you can't just leave them there and hope they work out just like astronauts when they're up in space they develop weakness in their muscles because they're not fighting against gravity the book uh, by Taleb called anti-fragile I'm not sure when that was written but it's actually it's referenced in this book and it's a book that I have on the list now I think I already got it actually it's already on its way but we'll read that one. It's called Anti-Fragile. But one thing, uh, one interesting way to put it is that if you had like a chess engine that is trying to get really good at chess, but if it lost, then it just didn't want to play anymore. <laughs> it's going to have a hell of a time <laughs> trying to get good at chess by not playing at all. And then we have this idea of concept creep, which is a big one that expanded the concept of safety to encompass things like your feelings. Instead of just your physical safety, now it encompasses how you feel about things. And that's another area that has to be protected. But you see this all over the place where you have these con this concept creep in these different areas. There were things like the DSM used to treat trauma as a very particular diagnosis and it had a very objective standard. But then over time, it became more subjective. If a person feels that they have been subject to trauma or feel trauma, then you have to accept the, their diagnosis of it instead of looking to objective criteria to make that determination. And then we've got Gen Z, which is overall much higher levels of anxiety and depression and suicide than the generation that came before it, than millennials. And in the book, they actually call it iGen from another book that was talking about this. But iGen, like the little eye for iPhone, but it's iGen. And people need challenges and stressors. Those are necessary things, especially growing up. So these are things that we're losing. Okay, the untruth of emotional reasoning. And this is going to be in a couple of parts because this is there was a lot that came out of this book and I just keep making way too long episodes nowadays. So I'm just breaking this up into two parts. 
the untruth of emotional reasoning and Haidt brings up the writer and the elephant which he came up with in his other book the righteous mind right which i trashed a little bit but <laughs> i thought that it had some good stuff to it and here it's kind of a really broad metaphor but it's the writer who's on the elephant and the writer feels like they're directing the elephant but really the elephant is kind of going wherever he or she wants and the writer just rationalizes that oh it's because i did this or i thought that and i'm the one who's directing the elephant and then cognitive behavioral therapy cbt is a huge very important thing to use method to use to really understand what's going on when it comes to students when it comes to the way our politics is going right now so cbt it's it's a very effective and safe way to deal with a lot of psychological maladies and it has these categories the cognitive distortions like i mentioned earlier and all these are extremely important so things like catastrophizing or making everything like oh it's the end of the world it's the end of the world overgeneralizing obviously dichotomous thinking that things are either black or white and that's it mind reading you see this a hell of a lot negative thinking discounting positive blaming others for everything then there's like emotional reasoning and labeling and so all these things are distortions that people go through when they're suffering from like anxiety or depression then they'll use these distort these cognitive distortions to further those impairments and cause more problems so you'll see this these kinds of symptoms arising where they're catastrophizing everything that happens that's bad it's the end of the world and they do all these sorts of things but the authors here are talking about how they see that in so much of the students nowadays and the way politics are working among students and all of these things or many of these things show up a lot when it comes to how they are trying to communicate and then of course we have this idea of microaggressions and how that switch now the idea of intent just goes out the window it's not about intent anymore so you have this shift from intent to impact now it's just how does it impact it's perfectly subjective how does it impact some somebody instead of you having to figure out what the intent of the sayer was and you've got this phenomenon of speakers getting disinvited from college campuses because of what they have to say us versus them this is a, another area here and here the author's going to you know a bunch of issues that were related to emails like at yale uh, there were emails about college costumes or emails where there was one where this uh, where this administrator had sent out a uh, sent an email to a student who was complaining about something and she used the word mold sorry you don't fit into the mold or something like that it was it was just a, a minor slip up in the way that she framed the idea of saying that oh well, i guess you don't fit in and then there's just outrage absolute outrage all over the place and the kinds of things that arose as a result of these we have uh, oh yeah so uh we get some of this issue you can tell that jonathan Haidt and the other author i'm not as familiar with but you can tell that they're ensconced in this elitist liberal <laughs> bubble uh, when it comes to trying to frame the information that they're talking about and a lot of the time i mean most of the time they're just trying to get across important ideas which is great fine wonderful but some of the time their framing goes askew like to say make a false equivalence and this could be some of their own black and white thinking but to make this false equivalence of what the left does with identity politics and what the right has been doing with identity politics and how acceptable the kinds of identity politic framing is within those movements or within those groups how adhered to it is how many of the presidential hopefuls on either side espouse these kinds of ideas i mean it's it's not even close to equivalent when it comes to that but i mean that's a different topic for a different time but it's like saying all religions are equally bad no some religions just like some political movements have way worse ideas even if though on the surface you might say that oh this this is bad or that's bad references marxist power structures and how that's just a different conception of the world when you look at everything through power structure lens and Marcuse, who is very influential from 1965, who wrote Repressive Tolerance about all this kind of political ideas. And then there's intersectionality, of course, the big thing, and self-censorship on campus arising where people just feel like they can't talk anymore. Even if they support people like a Yale or Berkeley or whatever, even if you support people, you feel like you can't publicly do that. You can send them a little text here and there or an email that says, oh, we support you, we're just not going to say anything. So these are new developments. And then intimidation and violence become modus operandi of a lot of these movements. And you have, like, Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos was getting invitations to campuses, and then there would be violence during the protests to that. And then Berkeley riots for different speakers. I think Ben Shapiro, you know, was one of them where it became an issue. 
But then what happens is that these institutions don't discipline the rioters, the people who cause damage to property or attack people or whatever, who are, quote, protesting. And so it's an encouragement for them to keep doing that. And this is where you start getting calls that these are acts of self-defense, preemptive self-defense, just complete nonsense, and that it was fine to use violence to prevent somebody from speaking. People like Charles Murray and Heather McDonald. Then you've got Charlottesville, and again, there's some going off the rails here in this leftist bubble. I mean, even Sam Harris acknowledged, and he'll correct people who come on a show and say, and Sam Harris is a huge TDS officer, he hates Trump, but he'll correct people who come on his show and talk about how Trump praised people on both sides of Charlottesville. And it's like, well, okay, to be fair, he completely disavowed any of the Nazis or Nazi sympathizers. He was just talking about, he explicitly said he was just talking about the people there to protect history. That's Those are the people he was talking about when he said there were good people on both sides. And so this is, again, I, it's amazing how these things, these myths just get perpetuated throughout the culture. Uh, but here, Jonathan Haidt and his co-author are just plugging it right in here. Then you've got ideas of speech being violence and how speech can cause stress and stress is harm and harm is violence and you're just ma attaching all these things, which of course would broaden it to a ridiculous degree and be completely meaningless. Obviously anything could cause stress. Somebody could go to work and say, you know what? You're doing violence to me right now by expecting that I do work while I'm here. So I'm just going to go take two weeks off and you think about what you did in this under this context you put anything create any say anything that is violent then we've got witch hunts a discussion of how witch hunts work and how they arise quickly there's this sudden infestation of your institution and they're accused of crimes against the collective the charges are often trivial or fabricated of course we've seen this all through social media this is what social media does nowadays the authors add that there's a fear of defending the accused because you can get wrapped up into it and discussions of how uh, just swaying and singing together, you know, things that you see in these protests, can make people more cohesive and more willing to accept these ideas. And then he goes into the role of the provocative right off of campus, because it's mostly liberals on campus. So the provocative right off campus and tries to create a contextual idea about this. And I, I try to give him a good amount of space on this idea. Obviously, these are really complex systems. But to merely say that that doesn't have any kind of an instigatory effect on the way that people act on campus. Of course, it's like, oh, she talked back, so I had to smack her kind of a thing. But still, to say that it had that didn't have any kind of instigatory effect on campus, uh, I think would be unjustified. But the authors talk about how you need institutionalized disconfirmation. You need people in the institution who are going to disconfirm all these ideas that people hold so firmly. And the issue is that the numbers are ridiculous when it comes to the relative liberals versus conservatives when it comes to professors and teachers and all that stuff. It's ridiculous now. It used to be two to one liberals to conservatives. Now, on average, it's about 5 to 1, which is a pretty significant departure from that. And in some areas, like in this particular author's field, it's 17 to 1. 17 to 1 when it comes to politics. And plus, you have to consider, okay, which ones are more likely to be espousing politics versus not. You know, if, if somebody's a, a veterinary... <laughs> school or something like that, it's less likely to come up. But if it's all the social sciences who are way disproportionately liberal, then you're going to have those ideas go unchallenged and just keep being recycled through the student body. And economics is the most diverse one intellectually, and it's four to one. And that's economics, four to one. So then you have these institutions become a collective entity, and then you're more likely to have witch hunts, and then you have things like Evergreen, which is, I mean, anybody who doesn't know the story of Evergreen, it is infuriating that anything like this could have possibly happened when the students just decided to go rogue, and they're like berating teachers and yelling at them, and there was one point where they had them hostage, and they're telling them, you can't go to the bathroom. Like, one of the, I think it was the, the president or something, he asked, uh, the God ass is ridiculous but he's like oh i need to go to the bathroom and they're like no hold it students idiot students this isn't the top of the <laughs> the academic food chain either these are like a bottom of the barrel kinds of students who are doing this not to slight everybody at evergreen obviously there are amazing people who came out of evergreen uh i saw a couple of them on youtube a couple of them pop up there and they're awesome uh, so no slight to them but but the students who were doing this kind of stuff the, these are not the brightest kids okay then there are those videos from Yale of that one girl who's just screaming at one of the administrators or one of the teachers and saying how, uh, you, you're supposed to make a safe space, it's supposed to be safe, and, blah, blah, blah. and just screaming and how, I'm so tired, my poor... <laughs> 
<laughs> Ivy League education, and I'm so oppressed and put upon. Shut the hell up. Anyway, so yeah, the, so this is happening all throughout, and then uh, we jump into the polarization cycle and talk about how there's mutual provocation, and uh, there's some references to Trump saying some mean things, and how parties are moving for, further apart. And we actually have uh, we have a couple of books that speak on this. One of them was there was that one what Hidden Tribes. I think we did it was like a study. It wasn't a book, but it was a study Hidden Tribes where it showed how the left has dramatically moved left where the right has only slightly moved right uh, and in some cases moved closer to the center. So it's not a mutual polarization. This is one where the left is veering hard left leaving, you know, most of the reasonable people behind and the right is pretty much staying where they are. This is insanity where we're going with all this stuff. And that's why we have people even entertaining the crazy ideas that are coming out now. And then, oh yeah, there's a reference to The Big Sort, of course, one of the really important books that we read that had the idea of how people are politically clustering now, and that leads to more polarization. So you end up around people who think like you, and you're able to cluster yourself online with like-minded people. And so the more that you're able to do that, the worse it gets when it comes to polarization. And then uh, you can have negative partisanship versus positive partisanship. Negative partisanship is just, I hate the other, that's why I'm here, versus positive, which is, I love my group, so that's why I'm here. And then there's some talk about how the right-wing media exaggerates it, um, and hate crime increases. And some implication about the responsibility of hate crime increases or something like that. So uh, that's that's going to be part one, just so we, we have a good idea what's what's going on here. And just obviously I'll do my full analysis and I'll do the full big picture stuff once we get to the end of the whole book. So we have it all down and can nail it. But at this point... There are a number of very important big ideas that are extremely explanatory when it comes to what's going on in the world. And by the time we get done with part two, I think everybody should write down and have at their beck and call all of these cognitive distortions that people use. There's this one method that people who have psychological impairments, one method they use to be able to cope with inclinations to do hurtful things to themselves or whatever. They use this method where they have a stupid voice, just a really silly voice for any kind of thoughts that come into their head that are bad ones. So it seems like something that's really simple, but it's apparently really useful and really effective when it comes to cognitive behavioral therapy. And CBT is one of those things that you don't need a whole bunch of medication and really intense therapy and that kind of stuff. It has a lot of really useful tools like just recognizing all these distortions that you tend to do for being able to cope with all this stuff so I think there's a very good right track here even if they are seriously biased and have some TDS that they should get diagnosed for I think there are some very important ideas that are coming out of this thing and when you put them all together with all the other stuff that we've read I think we have a pretty damn good handle on what happened to the world <laughs> and what we need to do going forward because later they will offer a whole bunch of really good ideas when it comes to students and and teaching so anyway th this is the last coffee house i really thank you guys so much for listening and i do uh finally have a a patreon page i've been doing this for a few years now <laughs> And I put that up, and if anybody ever wants to contribute in any way, it would be amazing. Obviously, nothing's going to change about any of this stuff. I'm going to keep doing it no matter what. But I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one. All right, bye.